my name is uh, Dan Vera. I'm a local uh, writer and poet and editor. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody watching live or uh, in the after recording, uh, since this is being recorded um, for posterity. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to this reading conversation um, featuring Greg Shapiro reading from his uh, book, um, How to Whistle, the Expanded Edition. Uh, I've been lucky to know uh, tonight's uh, featured writer uh, for, well, some years. I, I, I can't remember exactly when uh, when we first uh, connected, but um, I've also been delighted to publish his work in the past, uh, his poetry, and uh, it's just a, a great delight to um, moderate this discussion with, with Greg. Uh, Greg Shapiro is the author of seven books, including this expanded edition of his short story collection, How to Whistle, uh, Rattling Good Yarns Press. Uh, his recent Lit Mag publications include Exquisite Pandemic, RFD, Gargoyle, Limperist, Molly House, Impossible Archetype, and Dissonance Magazine, um, uh, as well as the anthologies This is What America Looks Like and Sweeter Voices Still, an LGBTQ anthology from Middle America. Uh, he's an entertainment journalist whose interviews and reviews run in a variety of regional LGBTQ publications. Uh, one of my uh, semi-regular delights is hearing who he has most recently spoken to. Uh, most recently, uh, Rita Moreno uh, excited me to no end. Um, is that interview out yet? Uh, soon. Soon. Okay. All right. Uh, but anyway, something to definitely look forward to. Uh, but anyway, it's uh, it's um, his reviews appear in a number of regional um, LGBTQ and mainstream publications and websites. He lives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, with his husband Rick and their dog uh, Coco. Um, welcome, Greg. Do you want to start us off? Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to read a little DC-centric snippet uh, from one of the stories in the book. Um, Shane didn't know anyone in Washington, DC. Marcella, his agent, put him in touch with Bob, a friend of hers who ran a bookstore and coffee house in DuPont Circle. They had dinner together a few times, but soon discovered that books and coffee were the only things they had in common. The only thing that is until Shane met Bob's roommate. They were having dinner at the Child Herald, shouting at each other so they could be heard over the music and conversation of the other diners. Bob kept looking at his watch like he had somewhere important to rush off to after dinner. Shane began to rely on his lip reading skills instead of trying to hear what Bob was saying. He was mouthing something about a book signing that he had organized for the following week when he suddenly stood up, stopped talking and waved vigorously towards the front door. There's someone I want you to meet, he said. Shane stood up too and turned around. He saw a man who was about his height with medium length black hair and the greenest eyes he'd ever seen in a distance coming toward them. Max, Bob shouted in a voice Shane didn't know he possessed. I want you to meet Shane Albert. Max extended a hand big enough for both of Shane's and they shook. Shane Albert, Bob repeated in the same booming voice the poet. There were two women probably in their late 30s or early 40s eating heaping salads at the table next to theirs. They were looking at the three of them standing around their small table for two shouting introductions and shaking hands. Excuse me, the one with the gray streaks in her hair said, but I was wondering if you would mind. I'm sorry, Shane said. I'll get the waitress and see if she can bring another chair. Oh, that's okay. I was just wondering if you would sign my copy of Tiger Meat. She pulled a beat up copy of his book out of her bag and handed him a ballpoint pen with teeth marks all over it. My name is Adrian, she said. After he finished signing her book, the waitress arrived with a third chair, having noticed the commotion they were causing. Would you mind signing this cocktail napkin, she asked. Pushing, she asked Shane, pushing the chair in under Max. They stayed at the table for another two hours. Max played in a band called Horseshoe Prince. He gave private music lessons during the day 
while the other band members waited tables or worked at Commander Salamander or Tower Records. Max and Bob invited Shane back to their apartment on Columbia Road, but he was suddenly very tired. They seemed like such a happy couple. It only reminded him of how lonely he was. The next morning, the phone rang at Shane as Shane was getting ready to leave for his first day of classes at St. Denise's. His housemate Felice knocked on his bedroom door. You have a phone call, she said, someone named Bob. There was a phone on a small table in the hallway outside of their bedrooms. Shane had missed the telephone man on the day he was supposed to install his private line in his room and hadn't had a chance to reschedule. Hi, Bob, what's up? Max really liked you. Is it okay if I give him your number? Why would he want my number? He asked. I thought he was your lover. Oh no, Bob said as if offended. We're just roommates. Just roommates, Shane repeated, trying to remember what Max looked like. He had tried not, tried not to be too obvious while mem he memorized every detail about him because he thought he and Bob were an item. Wavy black hair and green eyes with little flecks of gold. He had dimples in both cheeks and a strong chin. He was clean shaven. He wore a diamond in his left ear. Give him my number, he said. I'm home most nights after six. Max picked Shane up at home the evening of their first date. They were living in the enlightened age of safe sex and he had bought a box of condoms that afternoon at a drugstore across the street from St. Denise's. While he wasn't sure of the direction the night was going to take, he wanted to be prepared. Felice and Dor Dory were sitting in the living room watching an odd couple re rerun when he came downstairs. Here's Shane, Dory said in the voice of a fashion show runway announcer. He's wearing an oversized white cotton shirt, a black leather bolo with sterling silver and genuine turquoise clasp, black Levi's and black cowboy boots. Looks like he's ready for a night on the town. You look like Dwight Yoakam, Felice said. Where's your 10 gallon hat? Cut it out, Dory said. I think he looks nice. Planning on doing a little roping and tying tonight? Do you think I should wear something else? He asked more than a little self-consciously. Don't listen to her, Dory said. The only roping and tying she ever gets to do is to her tomato plants in the garden. I was only kidding, Felice said. You look smashing. Outside, they could hear an emergency brake being clicked into place and a car door open and close. Is it okay if we stay here? Dory asked. Would you mind introducing us? Not at all, he said. And then there was a knock on the door. Introductions were made and he gave Max a brief tour of the house. We have reservations at L'Oreal Plaza, Max said. We really should be going. It was nice meeting you both. Same here, they said in unison. Dinner was wonderful. They talked about growing up, how they both ended up in Washington, about writing and music and art. They talked about success and failure. After dinner, they walked into Dupont Circle and sat on a bench near the fountain where skinheads skateboarded and shot fierce looks at anyone who looked at them too long. Max drove him home and walked him to his door and kissed him goodnight. It was a slow and musical kiss, and he was excited by the prospect of the neighbors watching. It was Monday night, and they made a date for Friday night. Max said he'd call Shane the next day. The first floor of the house was deserted. He walked into the kitchen and got a can of tab from the refrigerator. When he got to the top of the stairs on the second floor, both Dory and Felice opened the doors to their respective rooms, and they sat on the floor in the small hallway and talked about love for hours. Thanks. That's from the story, uh, Indiscretions of a Poet, which is one of the new stories uh, in the book. Can you hold up the book? I can certainly hold up the book. There it is. Uh, that's the cover to look for, uh, since uh, so many of us are going back into bookstores um, carefully, uh, but look for that that cover. Uh, thanks so much, Greg. Uh, you know, that um, 
you know, one of the things I, I really like about your writing is the ways in which you can, you know, it's really kind of the details of place and memory, um, you know, um, understandably since Writer Centers and, you know, in Bethesda, you chose a, a you know, the DC short story. Uh, but, you know, just sort of hearing those places kind of root them. I mean, I, I don't think you need to be from DC to sort of kind of, you know, the, the narrative itself sort of kind of carries you along, but there's something about kind of the added, um, I don't know, the, the added element of sort of kind of knowing those places, you know, Child Herald, which um, I remember I having, having to look up to remember uh, closed in 2007, almost 15 years ago, which is hard to believe. But yeah, uh, there's there's references to to Tower Records and Commander sure. Salamander. Yes. Uh, really yes. pinning it into the 80s for sure. Right. I, I I'm pretty sure Commander Salamander. I think I, I walked in there in 84, 85 on my first trip to to DC. So um, and and of course you know some places that still exist on the landscape l'oreal plaza even though in a completely different building but uh but i am wondering you know um how do you go about you know weaving in kind of those i mean is it i mean i guess it's sort, sort of a larger question about how you sort of construct um you know whether you're setting the you know whether it's like half memoir and you're sort of setting them in place or or you know, how you sort of kind of balance sort of, um, you know, how to sort of kind of put place in, in the middle of the stories. Well, place just in general is very important in my work. And by, you know, I could just randomly pick a city uh, that, you know, but, I, but these are places that I knew personally uh, or that I'd heard of. So it's, I think it's important again to ground the story, not just to mention the city, but to mention locations and, and things like that. I think that it helps me as a, as a writer. And I think, I hope that it helps the readers also feel like they're connected to the place. Yeah, and because, uh, because some of these places are gone, it also, I mean, as you sort of pointed out, also roots it in time. Um, you know, like a specific era. Um, does that also, I mean, is that something that, I, you know, you sort of integrate that in your poetry as well, that, you know, because it's so sort of memoir specific. Um, is, is there, I mean, do you feel kind of a, like a commitment to sort of like, like verisimilitude that it has to be kind of rooted in a specific place or or do you ever like deviate from that? I mean, do you, do you feel, do you have an interest in setting it in some other place? Or is that something you, you know? I feel like I would have to do, part of me feels like my life has just been nonstop research about the places in which I live. Um, when I lived in Boston, when I lived in DC, when I lived in Chicago, and now living here in Fort Lauderdale in South Florida, I'm just sort of absorbing everything so that I can use it again right. in a poem or in a short story, or I, I feel like it's, um, I don't know, like I'm giving back to the place by, by committing it to words. Hmm. So I don't feel secure enough about writing. I mean, there's certainly other places that I've been to many times uh, that I don't mind making reference to or places. Uh, different places in those cities, but, you know, I like to celebrate the places where, where I've, where I have a strong connection. Well, and in the face of, um, I'm not gonna remember the author who, you know, the Velvetization of sort of the American landscape, mm. you know, with like chains and stuff and corporate stuff. Um, is there sort of an element of sort of radicality and sort of like, you know, um, you know, pinpointing these kind of unique places uh that aren't you know uh i mean you know you could choose to do like i mean one could i don't know why they do it but you know chilies or like a chain so that someone immediately is able to sort of recognize you know the place you're talking about but i'm wondering if there's something you know it seems to me that there's something sort of kind of radical about sort of uh preserving memory of place um 
Absolutely, yes. I mean, that's uh, one of the stories that I'm going to read in a little bit is really, really, I mean, there's just, it's almost like a litany of places. And the, the story actually takes place, it's very short, but it takes place over a span of 30 years. But it's, I mean, it's really short, but it's, there's like references to things from those times and especially places from those times. Um, that again, if it, if it sparks something in the reader, um, that makes me really happy. But, but if you didn't know about it, it's also my, my honor and privilege to lead you on this tour. Right. Um, let, let me back up and, um, your, your kind of formal instruction in writing is, um, you know, Emerson and an American. Um, That's correct. Right. Uh, so Boston and and DC. Um, I mean, I you know sort of kind of fine arts programs. You know, I, I assume you sort of explored short story writing in those programs. Um, yes. And, well, and, I, it's weird because I really did stop. I mean, I was always writing fiction, but when I was at Emerson, I was strictly a poet. That was. Mm. I don't think I ever wrote ever took a fiction class or turned oh. in uh, a fiction piece. It was poetry start to right. finish uh, while there. Uh, and then continued writing fiction and did a little bit of that at American. Um, but, you know, again, it was sort of like a lot of stuff happened after I left. Uh, uh, the late Richard McCann once kindly referred to me as AU's, the MFA program's most famous dropout. So I was very, I was touched, moved. Thank you, Richard. Um, but it was nice because stuff started, really started happening after I left, after I dropped out, after I left grad school and was just writing a lot, writing up a storm and publishing like crazy. So, um, Yes, so what, what the time at AU was great. I got to study with the most amazing people. Uh, the woman who ran the program had this amazing gift for bringing in exceptional writers. And, they would and, have their own writers. And there. who was that wonderful person who ran? Uh, that was the wonderful Myra Sklaru. Who, uh, who I believe created the program. I, I believe so. And yes. but she brought in, while I was there, she brought in Julia Alvarez, uh, Carolyn Kaiser, Robert Haas. Uh, it was it was amazing. So to be able to do whatever those brief periods with those people. And then on top of that, the people that, I, that were just teaching there full time, I had a class with Frank Conroy. Um, so yes, it was, it was a good experience. As was Emerson. I studied with Bill Knott. Um, in fact, it was Bill Knott who I always credit with launching me into publishing. He was the one mm. who said to our class, publish. <laughs> mm. And he taught us how, back in the Stone Age, how to prepare a package pre-email, yeah. pre-internet, right. how to prepare a package uh, to submit to literary magazines. Yeah, very important. Uh, uh, Discipline, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I lost out, especially back then. Yeah. Um, well, you know, you mentioned uh, Richard McCann, and um, I, I think you know, certainly Pride Month. Uh, I mean, at all times, but certainly this Pride Month, you know, uh, kind of first Pride Month in DC's, you know, queer literary landscape without. Uh, Richard without, without Richard McCann. And um, I'm, you know, he was somebody who, uh, whose work I love uh, and, you know, I know you loved as well. And I'm wondering, you know, we've talked, I mean, uh, you know, you and I talk uh, often. So, you know, part of this conversation tonight's a little- Pretty much daily. Yeah. I, I don't want to, I don't want to play pretend, you know, that we haven't had these conversations before, but I, I know that, you know, one of the aspects of, of McCann's work that's um, uh, really astounding is, you know, his poetry was uh, just sublime. And 
And I, I remember coming to his poetry first. Um, and As did I, yeah. And, yeah, and, and just adoring it and slightly lamenting that he didn't write much, you know, he moved on to sort of doing short stories. And uh, there's that aspect of his work that, you know, clearly if you're familiar with, uh, with his poetry, then you sort of saw those kind of the, the germs of what later became, um, you know, these, these short stories and well, Mother of Sorrow. If, if you're working in both, I don't think it's, I think it's impossible for there yeah. not to be crossover and, you know, it's, right. it, the threads just, they just join together perfectly. So yes, you can definitely, you can hear, you can see that in his fiction as well, in his prose. Right. And I see that in, you know, in your work, of course, and, um, you know, there's some examples in, in How to Whistle, uh, of course, of, you know, poems or short stories that began as poems. Uh, uh, so I, I'm just curious, sort of like, um, is there some kind of formula for sort of figuring out which poem needs to, you know, I mean, have you found that there's some I don't know, some element in a poem that sort of kind of leads you to want to expand it into, not expand it, but sort of re, re, revisit it. Well, uh, it's, the, it's this idea, of... it's the idea that, which I think if you're a writer, if you're a poet, uh, you know, or, or a fiction writer, revising and editing, it's as much a part of the creative process as just writing something brand new. Right. That, there's just, that's part of it. And so yeah. sometimes, at least for me, the revision process has led to ex expansion, to, to looking at something and saying, you know, the, the thing is that the poems that I expanded into short stories that some of them are in uh, this book, they'd already had a life as poems. They were already published in uh, right. literary magazines or anthologies. So they already had that life. And again, I think it's that idea that, oh, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm not writing anything new. What should I do? And then you go back and you revisit this old work and suddenly you think, oh, I can make this new, right? That's make it new, right? Isn't that the, that is the, the saying? Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to remember who's saying that is. I'm a little... Um, um, was it pound? pound? Was it? Oh, pound. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I believe it, it is. is. Yeah. Well, we won't talk about him much. Um, no, nasty, the, uh, really awful person. <laughs> Great song, uh, but terrible person. Yes, yes. Um, well, uh, why don't you read something, something else? Okay, so I, I'm going to read the story that I mentioned that started out as a poem. Which has, uh, uh, you know, an electric title. <laughs> uh, well, and, and so it started out as a poem, but then um, it's also the second of the new stories in the expanded edition of How to Whistle. Uh, and this story, uh, which was published in an anthology and co-edited by my dear friend, uh, Denise Duhamel. Um, anyway, this is a story. The story is called When Jesus Came Back to Skokie. Don't you remember it was October 1997 at the beginning of the High Holy Days. Jesus sat towards the back of the number 97 Old Orchard bus, smiling to himself at the numerical coincidence. He tried his best to be inconspicuous, reluctant about making eye contact with the Polish and Latina maids on their way to work who would surely recognize his familiar profile quicker than those Russian Jews or godless teenagers clutching skateboards. He gripped the bright yellow sports Walkman that he bought on closeout at Howard Street Electronics before boarding the bus. Only he knew that in a few years, the device would become obsolete, just like five and a quarter inch floppy disks, earth shoes, pay phones, and Republicans. He listened to the Amy Grant tape the African-American sales clerk had insisted on giving to him because as the kid said, 
He looked so much like a young Richard Gere. He took notes in a journal with a rendering of the mighty Morphin Power Rangers on the cover using a number two pencil he made with his bare hands. As the bus headed west on Howard Street, he recalled that the south side of the street was Chicago and the north side of the street was Evanston. Without touching them, he opened the windows on both sides of where he sat, just a crack, so he could take in the sounds and smells, children laughing and running on the sidewalk, the scent of fried fish and chicken from JJ Fish, and baking pizza from Eduardo's. He thought gasoline prices were high as he passed a filling station at the corner of Howard and Ridge. How strange it was to see Bethesda Hospital just west of Western Avenue sitting vacant after all these years, considering all the sickness and death on earth. It genuinely moved him when the bus driver stopped to pick up a man in a wheelchair at the corner of Oakton and Dodge. How the other passengers swiftly vacated the seats that flipped back and folded up to make room for the differently abled man. Privately, he marveled at the hydraulics of the vehicle, the way the front end of the bus lowered like a camel so that the man could roll easily aboard. At Oakton and McCormick, as the bus crossed out of Evanston and into Skokie, he noticed a decided difference in the air pressure. It was as if all the women on their way to cleaning houses had drawn in one collective breath of dread and refused to let it out, suffocation being preferable to servitude. Having listened to both sides of the Amy Grant cassette, he pressed the stop button on the sports Walkman. Before taking out the tape and slipping it into its case, he read the little booklet containing the liner notes and the lyrics, some of which made him blush. The bus crossed Crawford Avenue. He averted his eyes at the sight of the Jews for Jesus storefront, appalled at the contradiction in terms. Jesus really expected to see tumbleweeds blowing through the deserted ghost town streets of downtown Skokie. He was more than a little relieved to see the brick and stained glass majesty of St. Peter's Church, where Lincoln Avenue and Nile Center Road split. This was where he hung out in August 1969, the first time he visited the purported village of vision. Blending in with the other hippies with long hair, beards, and sandals, wandering the summer streets, congregating near the intersection of Oakton Street and Lincoln Avenue in front of Desiree Restaurant. Almost everyone had transistor radios pressed to their ears or dangling from straps around their wrists. According to the fifth dimension, it was the age of Aquarius and Jesus was swept up in the fervor of the fantasy. He especially enjoyed singing along with Dusty Springfield's Son of a Preacher Man. Everyday people of all ages clustered in the doorway of Little Al's record shop on Oakton, just east of Niles Avenue. They were snapping up 45s of Galveston by Glen Campbell, Sugar Sugar by the Archies, Crimson and Clover by Tommy James and the Shondells, Hair by the Cowsills, and Jean by Oliver. He almost stopped a little blonde haired boy from buying in the year 2525 by Zager and Evans, but he didn't want to burst the kid's bubble. A little more than 2,000 miles away, another man with a beard and long hair claiming to be a different kind of messiah with a dedicated coterie of devotees was committing a crime as heinous as crucifixion. If he could have, Jesus would have flown like Superman through the sky to 10050 Cielo Drive in Benedict Canyon. He would have spoken in his most soothing yet authoritative voice, explaining how what they were doing was wrong and cruel, evil and unnecessary. But Jesus found himself distracted by the giant illuminated red blown glass piece of fruit that hung as a shingle 
in front of the Apple women's boutique. Young women in dirty and frayed bell-bottom jeans entered alone or arm in arm with their boyfriends and left carrying shopping bags overflowing with chic miniskirts and frocks, patterned and see-through blouses and other groovy fashion finds of the era. To this day, Jesus alternates between feelings of guilt and powerlessness about not being able to be in two places at once, despite what others might think or have been led to believe. He feels a big fat tear roll down his cheek like the one shed by the Native American man in the 1971 Keep America Beautiful PSA TV commercial. On down the road, at the corner of Nile Center Road and Greenlee Street, he smiles to himself to think he couldn't have better placed the place planned the placement of the Carson's Ribs restaurant directly across the street from the Temple Judea Reformed congregation. Suddenly, Jesus is flooded with another wave of memory, recalling his second trip to Skokie 20 years earlier in 1977. He hadn't anticipated returning so soon after his first visit in 1969, but a man leading a Midwestern chapter of a Nazi party offshoot was planning to march through town with his fellow white supremacist followers. The purpose of the demonstration was not lost on Jesus, who was well aware of the considerable number of Holocaust survivors populating the village. As if to make up for the lost summer of 1969, Jesus intervened without even a single thought about gaining a possible convert. When the bus driver turned into the Dempster Skokie Swift Depot, Jesus was amazed at how different it looked from the last time he had been there. He jotted a quick note about it, along with a commendation to the architect for such a fine renovation and restoration. A Chrysler with the vanity plate saved pulled up alongside the bus at the intersection of Church Street and Skokie Boulevard. He could make out a Jesus fish decal in the back window, as well as a bumper sticker that read, quote, in case of rapture, this vehicle will be unattended, end quote. He shook his head, thinking to himself, don't be so sure. Thank you. That's great, Greg. Um, I I love how you. I mean, again, your your kind of ability to weave um, so many details. It's like this uh, kind of intricate, um, you know, again, patterning, I guess. Um, but um, uh, Nancy Camden uh, had a question in chat about uh, when you write the first draft, are you there living it? Uh, crafting later, or do you do both at once? Wow, that's a good question. Um, so I should really go back to the beginning, especially of that one specifically, which leads to, a, I guess I'm trying to like not go in too many directions. So when Denise and her co-editor were working on this anthology, she came to me and said, I'm doing this anthology. Do you have anything on the subject. And I, of course, said yes, <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't have anything at all. And this thing that's happened over repeatedly over time, way back when uh, Richard Peabody and Lucinda Ebersol, uh, the late Lucinda Ebersol, were editing the, the Mondo uh, anthologies. Uh, they came to me and asked me if I had anything to fit. And I just spoke before I thought and said, of course. And I didn't. So I wrote things specifically for them for that. So in the case of uh, the poem that this began as, it was something that I just had to like, you know, I was on the deadline and I and I needed to come up with something. And, and so I wanted to, I wanted there to be humor. I wanted it to be funny. Uh, I hope it was funny. I hope people we're laughing at the story, 
but I wanted the poem to be funny too. And that was the focus. And I thought, what's the best way to make this funny? And, and so that's what I came up with. So, so it was one of those cases where I just had to like, you know, I, I needed to write something and that's how that, but, but in, ter in terms of the story, which expands greatly, there was nothing in the original poem about Jesus's first trip in the sixties where he looked like a hippie, like all the other hippies. That right. was new to the to the story. Um, the the stuff that was later, the uh, the seventies thing. Th those are all things that came later that I just thought fit with the theme. You know, the idea that he was going to to Skokie, which is known for many things. But uh, so anyway, that was that was. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, Anyways. Yeah, no. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, uh, you know, when I, before you told me you were going to read that, um, that short story, I, I was going to ask you a question about it around kind of the idea of writing as revenge of, of kind of like, um, you know, because I know that you've got like, you know, you, you grew up in Skokie or that's, is that right? Yeah, so you yes. Yes. Got... I, I was born in Chicago. Uh, right. I lived there until I was I think three or four, and then we moved to Skokie. Yeah. So, but 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 I I know uh, one thing we share is sort of a conflicted relationship with the places that we we grew up in, um, and and so uh, you know this kind of idea of sort of kind of uh, again sort of sort of defining a place, um, you know, but you know uh, as sort of I don't know as a form of sort of talking back to your own experiences of a place. Uh, I mean, that can be really kind of, um, you know, I, mean, I, I, that's, I think that's an aspect of sort of like, you know, queer coming out too, that we have a way of sort of um, transmuting, you know, what can, what could be a toxic Absolutely, memory. it's, yeah. it's, yeah. Right. it's making peace uh, yeah. with the past and, and like, and re writing as revenge and, and right. finding a way to, you know, but, but I, but, you know, having, having said that that was going to be my question, you know, hearing you read that again, it strikes me that, you know, as somebody who did not grow up anywhere near, you know, in that region in Texas, you know, my only association with Skokie is one, it, you know, when I first heard it, I, it was kind of a funny sounding name. So Skokie, <laughs> sounded, you know, it sounds like a children's character or something like, um, but that, and then of course the the Klan march and the Supreme Court case, which you know is an important civil liberties uh, case, but that's you know that's pretty much it. And so I'm I'm struck hearing you read the short story again, that you mention that, but you mention that after you've kind of world built for a while for for people who don't know Skokie, you managed through Jesus <laughs> to sort of build this kind of very rich kind of tapestry of sort of memory and voices and people so that once Jesus gets to remembering, um, you know, uh, the Skokie, the, the Klan march, it's kind of one thing in the middle of this kind of larger, and, and that's kind of, in a way, that's kind of a, seems to me like it's, it's an, it's an act of grace towards a place that, <laughs> that was a source of some pain, you know? Yes. Um, yeah, so, so it was, it's, it was, it's freeing, it's liberating and it's, it's making peace and it's, but also, I mean, you know, trying and having a laugh at the expense of the place, um, yeah. you know, during the time that we were there, it was just, it was a very strange time, uh, I think to be anywhere, to be a kid anywhere um and and that was a, i mean i don't know i wonder like if if we had stayed in the city where you know the neighborhood where i was born i mean wow it would have just have been such a completely different experience and what, what um, was the neighborhood you were born in uh, we lived in it was an area called albany park oh which sure. is sort of it's on the i guess technically in the northwest side it's more right. north than west it's the um one it's, of the uh, like 
near Evanston, right? I mean, it's kind of close to the border, right? Or... Uh, no, it's actually, it's more, it's west. It's one of the last stops, I think, okay. on one of the train lines. Uh, okay. You know, there's right. the, it's now called the Brown Line, oh, fittingly right. enough. Uh, okay. And it's like, oh, what's that smell? It must be the Brown Line. Uh, but it's, it's a, it was a very, at the time, it's, it's continued to be different ethnicities in that neighborhood. Over Now it's, I think it's mostly a Korean neighborhood right now, but it was a very Jewish neighborhood. And then it was, right. uh, it was a, a Latino neighborhood and now it's a Korean neighborhood. And it's just one of those ones that keeps changing. But interestingly, what's happening is that as neighborhoods keep changing, well, you know, you live in DC, right? Right, so and I lived in, neighborhoods I lived in Chicago, people, so it's, yeah, yeah. Right, people, in neighborhoods where people would never ever live once they fix up a neighborhood, there, there's like a checklist. It's like, what's next? Where can we go next? And because Albany Park has access to uh, trains, to uh, public transit, sure, it makes it desirable. But it's also, if you want to be close to the lake, which I think is always a selling point in Chicago, it's really far from the lake. So, Well, uh... I'm I'm struck again. Um, you know, it's. I mean, the people that I, I love saying this, but the people that Jesus runs into uh, in that story. Um, you know, again, it's kind of you're you're populating the landscape with with flesh and blood people, and um, and and I, you know, I, I do think that's a grace note. I'm reminded of that really great one of my favorite lines of. Uh, Neruda's uh, about um, you know the importance of you know the thing that that matters is what's written in blood to be read by blood you know this mm. idea mm. Kind of thing uh, he was writing about well he's writing about uh, Lorca but um, that sort of kind of brings up the question around sort of dialogue you you've got this really you know your pieces you share that in in your poetry as well but your attention to sort of dialogue in some of your pieces. I'm wondering if, um, I guess sort of related to Nancy's question, but do you, I mean, is is it really your memory of dialogue or or do you, um, you know, do you carry a journal? Do you, I mean, it's you know, part of your process. Do you <laughs> take notes about things that people have said? Well, you know, the, the idea of, of, I mean, if I'm telling a story just without dialogue, it's memory, it's, it's stuff that's made up, but, but dialogue, I always worry about, uh, about even if there are characters that are made up, right. I don't want to misquote a character that I made up that makes any right. sense. So, so for me, dialogue is just, that's one of the things that really is like of the moment, like as these characters are talking, the, the dialogue is happening as I'm writing it, and then I'll go back, or I'll. But yes, that's that's. Um, I, I don't want to. Hopefully, no one will ever <laughs> recognize themselves in any of the stories. Oh, well, that's also the question about sort of kind of, you know, how much attention you pay to sort of like changing identities um, in, in in memoir. Yeah. Um, well, it's very interesting because. I've actually made another small writing leap in that I'm working on a lot of personal essays, which part of me thinks that comes from the fact that I'm a journalist now. Mm. Now, I've been a journalist for 25 years, but didn't start out as a journalist. So part of me just feels like that I'm not, that's just, the, the, you know, the truth is right. so much now part of one of my write part of my writing. So now I'm like, okay, can I transfer that to this? So even there, even like with these with these um, memoir type things, these uh, creative, I'm just very cautious about. You know, I don't want to say something even if I'm not quoting exactly. I don't want to say have a character or a person say something that they wouldn't have said. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, no, no. It, um, we um, we currently have twenty six people uh, 
which is fantastic. Thank you, uh, I want to give Thank I want to give people yes. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, I want to give everybody a, an opportunity. If you, if uh, I think I sort of asked the questions that were on chat, but if there's a question you'd like to pose um, to Greg, um, please uh, post it in the chat, and we will uh, we'll see about talking about it. Uh, um, I wanted to, um, you know, uh, we we're talking about dialogue, and you know, it's something I really you know, sort of, uh, how, to, how to phrase that? I mean, I, I'm reminded of uh, Felice Picano, you know, whose who's dialogue is really kind of crisp and tight. And, uh, and, and so I'm sort of reminded of him in, in your short stories is, are there other people who, uh, yeah, are there other people who kind of inspire your work or? or yeah, it's, it's a very, very, it's a long and always uh, shifting list. Um, you know, I have my, I'm very lucky that I, I like, I know, right? I'm like, I'm not just reading writers. I actually know these people. And that sometimes I just, I freak out yeah. when I think about that. So I would say like my, my writer family, I mean, that includes you, that includes, Kim Roberts and Denise Duhamel and Kari Dodd, who I see in the picture here, and J Judy, just so many of these people. So I'm very, very lucky. Uh, Michael too. So yes, I'm, I, that to me is, that's a, just a true source of inspiration. Um, and then just, I mean, I, I don't have a favorite writer because it shifts sure. so much. Like before we were talking about that book, the, the Vanita Blackburn book, how to wrestle a girl. I'm like, this is a person who sort of came out of nowhere. I'd never heard of her before. I feel bad that I hadn't, but this book is just, it's blowing my mind. Every single page is so amazing. So check that out when it comes out in the fall. Um, so yes, it's that kind of thing. But like I was, I just, I recently interviewed Paul Rudnick, uh, oh. who is known as a screenwriter. He wrote Sister Act and Adam's Family Values and um, the play and movie Jeffrey. Um, yeah. But he also wrote some really wicked funny books and his newest book is incredibly hilarious. And so, you know, there's that thing where it just, I'm just like, oh, if I could be just slightly as funny as Paul Rudnick, that would be so great, but. Well, I, I also think that, you know, authors give us the, it's like they're 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 uh, um, you know they're roadmaps you know they're they sort of give us the the permission or the opportunity to sort of kind of push kind of in in, in different directions. Um, uh, I'm curious. Oh, I was thinking about the way in which um, you know this idea, especially because it's a, a Pride Pride Month reading, the idea of queer you know queer lineage, you know that. Um, you know, as people, I was talking to somebody, uh, Bo Young, who we, we talked about, uh, uh, writer, editor, friend, uh, this whole idea of having to come out of erasure over and over again, that people who, you know, people don't really share their coming out stories anymore, but it, it, it continues to be a dynamic of sort of coming out into erasure, which means having to recover or discover you know this history of of like experience or right well i mean this as a as a young gay um yeah. and i mean like really long ago for me it was when i read um dancer from the dance by andrew holland right. sure. um that was like it was life-changing it was yeah. and i always talk about because at the time I ended up reading back to back. I read Dancer from the Dance. And then right after that, I read Faggots by Larry, the late Larry Kramer. Kramer, yeah, yeah. And I know that he is <laughs> vilified and that book is hated. But at the time, those two books were really, really important sure. because suddenly I was like, oh, th there, there was recognition, like a, a light bulb went off of sorts. Right. So, well, it's also as if the, as if one's, I mean, I, you know, I always try to remember that, you know, most of us come out 
or you know we come into a world that has no place for us or has no right words uh, or healthy words for who we are and so part of the experience of coming out should be one of sort of claiming or creating a cosmology in which we can exist and and be who we are and sort of have kind of full lives and I think these writers sort of allow us to do that you know they um you know one suspects it's it's I don't want to say it's easier because I know sort of the experience is always the experience uh, but you know, certainly the, you know, the internet has made it easier for people to sort of share experiences. But then when you think about like, like Andrew's generation, like who did he have before him? Right. Right. I mean, so he's sort of like at the top of this particular heap yeah. and so many have come since. Like I, I'm not like David Levitt. I interviewed David Levitt last year about his new novel. And it's, that's another case where it's like, so he was part of that, you know, he's on that tree. He's a right. branch on the tree that is really, you know, Andrew Holleran and Ed White and, you know, and all these other people. So anyway, it's just. Yeah, and also, you know, the writers and um, and the venues. I mean, like, you know, like the Writers Center and- well, Of course, yes. Are, you know, places uh, that are committed to sort of celebrating and creating spaces for these, vo you know, these voices. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly more acceptable now, but- Yes, we're lucky to have lifetime. that. Um, Absolutely. And, um, well, um, I'm, I'm gonna check the chat real quick. I can okay. figure out how to do this. Um, nope. Everybody is just delighted. Oh, um, shucks. So. Um, uh, they're giddy with satisfaction. Um, well, do you have any clothes with like a suit looks like a really short one? Uh, sure, that'd be great. Okay, I'm gonna close with one short oh, one. No, but, uh, but, but before you do that, Greg, where can they find the book? What's the best <laughs> way to find the book that will support the publisher and, yes. and, and the author? Rattling Good Yarns Press. That is the name of my publisher. He's actually uh, here tonight. Uh, uh, in one of the corners, Rattling Good Yarns Press. Um, there he is waving. And uh, so if you just Google that, uh, you can find me on Facebook if you want to ask me about how to find it too. I think I've got links on my page, all that stuff. So that's there. Um, so this last very short piece, really, really short. Uh, this is called Defending Karen Carpenter. In the basement of Robbie and Ricky's parents' two flat, one floor below their widowed grandmother's apartment. After we'd finished our daily rehearsals to all boy garage stage shows where we lip synced and pretend to strum guitars and run our fingers across keyboards that aren't plugged in into electric outlets in much the same way the Partridge family did, we'd huddle together not touching like football players did, although I would have if somebody had asked. We opened our flies to expose ourselves and compare our individual and collective growth of a less obvious nature. I often thought about Karen Carpenter, how she wouldn't have passed judgment on us, how she wouldn't have screamed and yelled at us the way Robbie and Ricky's grandmother did that time when we didn't hear her sneak up on us from behind. At the onset of puberty, I found myself expending an awful lot of energy in defense of Karen Carpenter. With my voice cracking and my legs still weak from the growing pains of the night before, I was vocal in my opposition to anyone who dared to put down the dark-haired angel from Downey. It was like when Davy, the sexy, skinny, scary older guy who lived across the alley from Robbie and Ricky, with his creepy sisters and even creepier parents, would invite us over and give us things just for the chance to run his sexy, skinny, scary fingers over our rapidly metamorphosing bodies. Davy was the adult who supplied me, the bookish one, with contraband copies of The Exorcist and The Godfather, two books that instill the fear of Catholicism in me, a fear greater than that of the devil the mafia, or child molesters. Karen would have understood the small price I paid for knowledge and experience, a gnawing quest as persistent 
and bottomless as appetite. I believe it was Karen Carpenter who saved me from thinking about how the white blonde hair I was born with darkened a quarter of a shade with every birthday, my only distinguishing mark in a family of mousy hair dullards taken away without my permission. How my younger brother continued to pummel me into submission in front of his friends as well as my own. I would listen to Karen complain beautifully about rainy days and Mondays while I rubbed the aching just punched parts of my arms, chest and stomach and know if anyone could save me from the cruelty of the world, it was Karen Carpenter. And when I began to deprive myself of food, part contest, part punishment, it was Karen's dulcet tones that harmonized with the singing from my shrinking belly. I believe it was Karen Carpenter who without much fanfare died for my, for all of our sins. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Um, thank I'd you like to the Writer Center and Zach and yeah. Amy, thank you, thank you. I'd like to thank the Writer Center for sponsoring this event. Uh, writing creates worlds and many of us are alive or more alive because of the stories of LGBTQI people who provide a lifeline uh, for imagining a world where we can all uh, live and be free and thrive. Uh, thank you and good night. <laughs>